guys, Christian Murray here, publisher of the Queen's Post. Today I'm going to be talking to Glennis Gomez. She's a candidate for the 26th Council District that covers Sunnyside, Woodside, parts of Astoria and Long Island City. Hi Glennis, thank you very much for joining me today. How are you Christian Murray? Thank you so much for having me here at Queen's Post. Oh well it's terrific to have you. So, so Glennis, you know, just, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and why you're running for office and, you know, what, what sort of brought you here today? Thank you. Uh, so why am I running? Uh, Glennis Gomez is running because we are in the midst of a crisis that everyone is pointing fingers at, the pandemic, COVID-19, uh, this virus that has really uh, created a lot of chaos in New York City. Um, but above all of that, um, I'm truly running because I have many lived experiences that many families in this district can relate to. And um, prior to COVID, prior to this uh, terrible virus, COVID-19, we've been de dealing with many injustices, with many inequities, and um, it's time to expose them. And I have the educational background, I have the work experience at the political and government level, and above all, I have the lived experiences that are so needed in this time and age, especially in government, in City Hall, and I think I can bring that to City Hall to make some real changes here in District 26. Uh, Glennis Gomez is an average woman that is just pushing herself to challenge herself and to do big things uh, for the greater good. Um, I am a mother. I am a mother of a six-year-old that is the love of my life. I will soon be um, a mother for the second time, so I'm very blessed in this campaign trail to receive this blessing, to be a mom again. Uh, and as a woman, as a mother, as an Afro-Latina, I think that women have a big opportunity right now to continue to empower themselves and to continue to lift and restore other women. So um, I hope to be an inspiration and motivation for other women that see me as a candidate. I'm running because I care about District 26 uh, I came to Queens with nothing six years ago after experiencing domestic abuse. I entered the shelter system, uh, which I dealt with a lot of trauma there, and then went on to transitioning to live into public housing in Queensbridge North. Um, I worked for the Department of Education for the past four years doing community organizing throughout the city. Mm -hmm. uh, to increase diversity in specialized high schools. So um, I have 20 years of experience uh, working with the public. And I think that that spirit of resiliency that uh, characterizes a lot of New Yorkers, that's what I have and that's what I want to take to City Hall to make these necessary changes of all these systems that I've experienced, experienced personally and that need a real firm um, organic voice in City Hall. And that's why I'm running for City yeah. Council in District 26. I mean, that's quite a story. So, so Glennis, tell us, how did you wind up in Queens? Obviously, you're having a you're having a pretty tough go of it. Clearly, uh, I'm not going to push you on what happened there, but how did you wind up in Queens? And was there sort of symptoms in in Queens that helped you out? How did how did it all come to be here? Well, I'm a Bronx girl. Mm -hmm. uh, all of my government and po and political life and work experience has been in Washington Heights. Hmm. I used to work for um, Adriano Espaya, he's our current oh. congressman. Hmm. Um, and I was also a chief of staff for an assembly woman uh, over in Washington Heights as well. Um, I came to Queens six years ago hmm. after experiencing domestic abuse. Hmm. And um, I ended up in a shelter because I had to exit this terrible relationship so um, thanks to the shelter system, I had a place in where I can rest my shoulders and start over a second was opportunity. Was it a shelter and in this district? Was it a shelter in this um, district? It was, it was uh, here in Queens by East Elmhurst by LaGuardia Airport. Oh, yeah. Okay. And I lasted there almost two years. 
So, um, you know, within a, a time of a lot of struggle, uncertainty, I would say, and um, just starting from scratch, zero. Um, I was very foreign to Queens. I didn't even know mm -hmm. how to take a bus. I didn't know <laughs> where you make a left, where you make a right. Um, I wasn't here in, in Queens with mom or dad or any um, yeah. friends or family members. So I really had to learn my way around Queens. Awesome. Awesome. Then after that, I'm sorry, I, I transitioned over to public housing to Queensbridge North. Yeah. So that's how I ended up in District 26. Uh, as a resident there, a lot of struggles and a lot of challenges that I also experienced. Um, and now I reside in Astoria. I And it's, it's an excellent neighborhood. Queens is an excellent borough because there's so much diversity. Um, but that is how I landed in uh, Queens and in District 26. Fantastic, fantastic. I mean, Queens is, is, is addictive, right? You, you, you can't, it's hard to leave once you sort of get it in your blood. Um, oh, most definite. Yeah. So, so tell us about, you know, tell us about what you're sort of running on, so to speak. What is your, your platform? I mean, I, I saw in the forum... You know, things like, you know, you didn't want to defund, you don't want to defund the police, you're interested in public safety. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? Definitely. Uh, my campaign is running on something very clear mm -hmm. and simple. Okay. And it's that we need and we must bring back the dignity, the unity and the trust into our communities. Mm -hmm. uh, when I spoke about public safety, I said that I am not for defund the police. I think that the term defund the police has brought about uh, a message that has not resonated in a positive way with our community. And with that term and with everything that's happening right now, when we see all this increase in crime, um, that's due to the wrong messaging. And that wrong messaging is bringing about div division and where you have the community residents in one side and then you have the NYPD on the other side as, as if there were two gangs against each other. Mm. And that is not what New York City is known for. We have a lot of residents in District 26 when I was doing petitioning and throughout this whole entire campaign trail in where they have shared their own testimonies with me and where they feel, they feel insecure, they don't feel safe. A lot of mothers that can't let their children out to play, um, you know, even with what's happening now in the trains, we see it in the day of light. When you're going to work, our working class is unsafe. So I truly believe that when it comes to uh, doing a reform of the NYPD, hmm. I truly believe in a reform. I don't believe in defunding. I think that we need to do a reallocation of the funding within the NYPD. Mm. I think it's necessary to make sure that we're doing right by many of the people in the district. And as I've gone around, as I said, in the district, many folks are scared. They're scared to speak up about this issue because they feel as if they speak in favor of the NYPD. They are speaking against the discrimination and the different abuses that the NYPD has done in the past. I think that it's a time yeah, that we is, must is, work together. Is this district wide or are you finding it in pockets? Like, I don't know, is a Queensbridge residents telling you this or a Sunnyside Gardens residents telling you this or a LIC Hunters Point people telling you this or Woodside Houses telling you this? Or is this just widespread, this whole, this whole feedback you're getting? This is District 26, but this is also citywide. Okay, yeah. So, you know, if, when you become a city council member, whether it's for District 26 or any other district, you will also represent the city of New York. Absolutely, yeah. So we cannot just legislate for a specific district. We have to understand that we, when we do present any type of legislation or we make any type of decision, it affects the city of New York. Mm. So it's very important that we make peace. Mm. 
And when I say we make peace, I'm talking about the NYPD in our community. So we must work with the NYPD so that the NYPD, within the funding that they have, those fundings can be reallocated. For example, a, a cop can get a, a, I'm sorry, a cop can start working, right? And they'll get like about $42,000 a year, 45. Mm -hmm. It is after five years that they start making that $90,000 a year. But within that time, the, the role of a cop is a riskful job. The cops on a daily basis are risking their lives to protect us. So we, but we must hold these cops that abuse of their power, that use discrimination, and that are racist, we must hold them accountable. And the best way to hold them accountable is to, when, when any resident experiences this, we must take those cops away from their uniform and from their position. But at the same time, the NYPD must be reinvented. Instead of giving six months training, instead of uh, two years before you can become a cop, let's extend that. Let's provide more training. Let's work with social workers. Let's put them inside of the NYPD and provide workshops for cops so that they know how to handle certain behaviors when they approach a certain situation. But our community wants to see more police presence. And that is the voice that I am going for in this campaign, that our public security cannot be negotiated. Our public safety is non-negotiable. Okay. And without public safety, we have pure chaos. Without public safety, our working class families do not feel safe to return to work. Our children cannot be educated. Our children cannot feel safe outside. So we need safe streets and we need safe communities. And I think that's a priority here in District 26. All right. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to a different topic, Glenis, and that deals with land use. Uh, it's an ancient discussion now, but still it gives <laughs> us an indication as to what how people think. Um, Amazon in 2018, um, you know, what, what were your thoughts on that whole process? And, and would you would you also, you know, if you're, if you're able to turn back time, would you be an advocate for seeing big office space there as opposed to maybe residential down the track? What, 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 is, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm going to respond to this question as a resident hmm. and as a candidate. Uh, because at the time this was happening, I'm a resident here in District 26. Mm. And I personally think as a resident that I was truly excited to know that Amazon was coming. Um, I saw a huge opportunity for um, our community, for myself mm -hmm. as a resident. Um, I saw an opportunity for New York City to be uplifted. And um, I didn't have any concerns that uh, small businesses would be affected. You know, uh, we continue as residents and as New Yorkers, we buy from Amazon regularly. And this is not just Glennis Gomez, but the world is buying from Amazon here in New York City. And it was in, an opportunity for us to thrive, uh, for my neighbors, something to look forward to. And I think that it was a way for us to become more independent. Um, you know, while some mom and pop shops give us the life hood here, surely, and, and I am pro uh, small businesses, I don't think that only with small businesses do we allow um, our residents to have significant movement outside of entry level positions. So mm -hmm. these jobs that could have come to Queens and New York City in general, they were an opportunity for our youth. They were an opportunity to be able to expand other horizons. And Amazon could have been um, that stepping stone that for many families in our district would have just pushed them to the next level. So it was a lost opportunity. Now, as a can and another thing, um, I don't think as a resident, when I saw the signs that were being put up to have certain meetings, they were not welcoming. It's like if the decision was already made. Every time I saw a sign, it had a, a red circle with a slash and it says, say no to Amazon. 
So that was never inviting for me to say, well, what does Amazon want to bring? Or what would I like for Amazon to bring? The decision was kind of made. So as a candidate, I see it as a missed opportunity. I think that uh, not enough outreach was done to the community to participate in this decision. And at times I feel like if uh, we are underestimating our residents and our district, uh, because people, the youth and, and just families that have children, uh, you know, they want independence. And at times you cannot just uh, tell people, go only with the small businesses and go into these entry level jobs. People want more. We have people with the capacity, with the education and with educational skills and work skills to make the $90,000 a year, to make the $100,000 as a regional manager, as a, re uh, a public relations uh, a manager. Mm. So it was a true, true missed opportunity. And if I can turn back time, I would, as a candidate, or if I was the city council member, I would do more outreach. You know, I have a lot of questions. Was the outreach done in different languages? Were their hearings accessible for the people in the district? And also, this is a situation um, where we lack strong negotiations. So had I been the city council member, I think that we need more time at the decision-making table negotiating what's best for our community. But also, in order to do what's best for our community, we have to bring them on to the process and really hear what the community wants. How did you think the current councilman handled it? Well, the current council member, it looks like he did what he could. Um, personally, I also think that we could have made this decision not just with the current council member in District 26, but we could have um, had a vote in where all of the city council members citywide could have voted on this because I didn't see Amazon coming into District 26 in Queens. I saw Amazon coming into New York City. So this could have been profitable for residents citywide. Mm -hmm. Now, fair enough. What would you like to see in that area now, Linus? The moment it's just a sort of an empty, you know, unloved area. What would you, what would you like to see there now if a rezoning came your way? What would you what would you look for? Well, we have to lift ourselves up from this pandemic, mm. from this crisis. And I think it's very important that our families go back to work. Uh, we have a lot of people that are still in the unemployment line. And I would definitely love to see um, more creativity in creating our own jobs here in New York City. Um, I would also like to see if potentially more schools as we have a crisis here, especially in District 26 and in Queens and where we need more, more um, school seats uh, for our children. So if we can build um, new schools, that will be excellent. And also new, real, real accessible, affordable housing um, and better than what we have, which is uh, NYCHA. Mm. Okay. And I think those are the three needs that any any resident in, in New York City and in District 26 is in dire need of. We need employment, which will create opportunity, and we need better education so that we can reinforce the future of our children. And we need housing because you can't work and you can't go to school if you don't have a place to call home. Right. And that it's affordable here in New York City. Right. I mean, you, you hear sort of people say, well, you know, luxury towers or big, big residential buildings down there. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? No, that obviously they don't all have to be like these, you know, expensive buildings. But what are your thoughts on like 30 story buildings down there, seri a number of them with a whole lot of office space? So is that something that you could sort of envisage? Well, I will share this with you. Mm -hmm. As I said before, six years ago, I came here brokenhearted, as many women have experienced after experiencing domestic abuse. You're left with nothing and you're left with a child or children and left alone to kind of figure it out on your own. 
And when I experienced the shelter system, I realized that it is a prison-like system and it is not a home for children or women or families, let alone for seniors, because we have everything in the uh, shelter system. Then I transitioned over to public housing, what we call NYCHA. You were there for two years. It must have yes. been a pretty tough two years. Just tell us a little bit about that. Yes, uh, I, I stay true to what I am saying. This is not my opinion. This is yeah. my testimony, and this is the testimony of many other families. It mm -hmm. is a prison-like system, and the city of New York is profiting off the need of our struggling families. Yeah, we sorry. can build new, real, dignifying homes. We can do it. This is New York City, 21st century. This is where everybody wants to be in. They, people, you have people risking their lives so every single track, day. But why, why was it a prison? And, and, and it sounds as that was a ghastly experience. So can you just tell us a little bit about that? It, was a, it's a, it, it continues to be a prison-like system because for example, when you enter the shelter system, mm -hmm. uh, you are not looked as, as somebody that can contribute to society. You are looked as the lowest thing ever. You're not, um, there, there's no questionnaire of who you were, what you're going through, and, you know, what have you done or what can you do? Um, you know, it's just definitely, I'm very grateful I had a roof over my shoulder. 100% and it, that allowed me a second opportunity. But I'm talking about the conditions within the shelter. Yeah. Uh, it's not a home for our children. We have over 70,000 children that are living in temporary housing shelter system. And that is not a home for our children. The system itself affects our children and their educational development when they're not living in a proper place that they can call home. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our families are feeding themselves off of processed food because in these shelters, you are not in your own apartment. So you don't have the space, the adequate space to have a regular refrigerator. So you're using the uh, motel-like uh, yeah. refrigerators where you cannot store enough of, you know, the nutritionist wow. food that you, you can in a regular refrigerator. Um, obviously you have to, um, abide to a specific time. You have to get back into your room at 9 PM and sign in, sign out. So let's say if you're washing clothes, because some of these shelters have, um, a washer and dryer area and you just forget to go and sign in or, or, you know, to sign in mm -hmm. for that night, the system kicks you out from the computerized system. So now you're going to have to leave from that shelter that same night and you will have to go back to PATH to restart an entire process. Oh. So that is that is not fair. But let me tell you, it's not like you're going to go back and you're going to go back into, I'm sorry, you're going to go back into your same room. No, that room is already going to be allocated to another resident. And it costs about $175 per night Hmm. Almost five, some families paying $5,000 a month to be in a shelter, not the family, but the system, New York hmm. city taxpayers, that is where their money is going to. And I was, I, I didn't know this when I was in the shelter, when I lived there, I had a budget letter and it was one day that I decided to question the budget letter and to look at it and try to understand what was being spent. What and is I a questioned budget letter? What is a budget? Uh, it's it's like? the budget letter from um, the Department of Welfare Services because obviously I'm in a shelter. I didn't have the adequate job. Uh, I'm just trying to start all over from scratch. So um, the the welfare center was a human resources was paying five thousand dollars a month for my son and myself to be in this room. And when I question, so it says so that on a form then it says they yeah, give you like a bill, like a health insurance bill. It's like it's a budget letter letting you know the expenses of where you're staying. Like for example, I they were paying for a phone service, but I didn't have access to a phone service. So that's the phone service for the actual shelter for the building and so, for the so administrators. 
like so like if I go stay at a hotel right and after three or four nights I'll get a bill saying all right hundred dollars for this night next hundred for the next hundred for the next the end of the weekend it's a tab of three sixty right do they do the same thing then if you're in a homeless shelter they say all right well you know Murray you've been here seven days two hundred bucks a day you know it would have cost the city two thousand five hundred and then and they show you that letter and is that what they do? Well, like I said, it's a budget letter that mm -hmm. everyone who is under um, HRA yeah. through the Department of Homeless Shelter, you will get this budget letter and it will tell you um, who's under that budget letter. So in that case, it was my son and I, and every two weeks they were paying $2,500 for my stay there at this, uh, at King's Inn uh, Family Center in East Elmhurst. So when I questioned oh. it, the mm. representative said to me, Yes, sweetie, they're paying $5,000 a month for you to be in this shelter. So think about it, almost two years, we're talking over $90,000 in one year. So mm -hmm. I can assure you that I could have been placed in my own apartment paying less than that and I could have been paying my own rent. Right. So we have to change that. And I want to go to City Hall to close a lot of shelters and to finally move our working families into permanent homes because a shelter is not a home. Okay, yeah. I mean, I spot this all spun out of our discussion about what to do, <laughs> but it's all rather interesting. So, so going back, yeah, and it's part of it's definitely part of my campaign. Yes, yeah, so uh, and, and I'm yeah. No, it's interesting. I, I, and go so therefore with that with that sort of you know in the back of your mind when you see sort of proposals like what could potentially happen at what would have been the Amazon site. Yeah, how, how do you look at it then? We're going back into the Amazon? Yeah. Question? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, when I was in the shelter, oh. I wasn't in District 26 and we were not dealing with the Amazon uh, coming into yeah. Queens. But once again, if we had it right now, um, it would be, a perfect place for many families, specifically living in the shelter system right now that can benefit from these opportunities or these potential jobs. Okay. Uh, so once again, we definitely need to bring in more employment to District 26. But um, just to give you one more point when it comes to the shelter system and what's truly happening in New York City and how much it affects our district, it's that the shelter system is feeding our public housing system as well. They're working together. And once again, I am saying this out of my own personal testimony. And I'm also saying this from the testimony of many, many families in District 26 and citywide. Uh, New York City is profiting over people's need and the need is real affordable housing. And this is what's happening. It's like a pipeline. For example, right. in order for you to get into a NYCHA development, Mm -hmm. for you to be eligible when you go and get an application right now and you can get it it will tell you that the preference is if you are currently in a shelter if you are not in a shelter you will be waitlisted and i am not talking about a waitlist for 12 months or six months it can be four it can be five years or seven years so I, as a city council member, I would love to work hand in hand with whomever is going to be our controller. And let's do a thorough investigation of how these funds that the Department of Homeless Shelter has and NYCHA has, what is truly happening? Because they're truly sending a subliminal message to our residents and saying, come into the shelter system, let's profit off of you over $90 a year, and then let's make you eligible to pay 30% over in public housing, so, so also, you, so also known as NYCHA. That, that, that some people might be tempted to sort of say, well, listen, I want to get NYCHA housing because it's, you know, less, it's like very affordable. I, I think what I'll do is I'll declare myself homeless for a, for a couple of months and maybe I can get into NYCHA that way. Is that kind of where you're going with us? Well, let me tell you, it's not that people are saying, let me do this. The system is forcing them to do that because right. we have to be realistic here and we have to be honest. Mm. Um, uh, this, my campaign, it's not just, this is not just politics. 
Mm -hmm. Um, I truly have gone through several struggles that as, and as a woman of faith, I truly believe that I have been called to serve my community and to speak up at this level, to say it how it is so that real change can come about. Mm -hmm. We have many of our graduates that graduate from college that are living in, in a one bedroom or two bedroom apartment as roommates paying $3,000 a month and everybody's paying a piece of that. 1,000 here, another thousand there. We have a lot of our families that they're living in rooms Mm. because there is no affordable housing because the only true affordable housing that we have is called New York City Housing Authority where you pay 30% of your income. But that NYCHA Mm. right now is in deplorable conditions. It's falling apart. And in order for you to get an apartment, the preference is for the families that are currently in the shelter. Mm. So the math is easy. Right. I mean, I mean, if you wanted to play fast and loose, you really needed a place to stay. I mean, I guess guess you might think, well, you know, hey, I'm going to be homeless for a few months so I can get it so I can afford a place. Right. I I don't know. I mean. I'm sure that's what well, some that's the need. If we yeah. have a family that lost their job, yeah. if we have a family that lost their home because they were being evicted, obviously you, you lose your job, you're unable to pay your rent. And if your rent is as sky high as it is for many families where you have to get an apartment for 2000 minimum rent is like $1,700 and, and that can be a one bedroom, mm. you know? So you have no other options. And that's what the system is offering. It's not offering options. And I truly want to go to city hall. So is that why you think the numbers, do you think it inflates the number of homeless then? If if I know that I have to get, if if I know that I have to be homeless or be in the shelter, in a shelter rather, to to get NYCHA housing, do you think that that would create an incentive to, to go into a shelter in the first place. So how do you think the numbers are inflated in shelters because of this pipeline system? And if so, how much is it inflated? Christian, Hmm. we just went through a pandemic for an entire year and where I think over 40 million families lost their jobs. Hmm. So the number one uh, basis for you to keep up with the home is your employment. Yeah. So now you've lost your employment mm. and it's not like you can go out and get another one because of what we're going through. Things mm. have changed. Um, actually, you know, uh, many of the families that stood with a job or that may have a job till today and didn't lose it through the pandemic are people maybe like you and I that are sitting in front of a computer. Yeah. But many of the traditional jobs that require physical labor We have lost them. And the city is also not doing enough to kind of prepare that those type of uh, of families to go back to work. Mm -hmm. And everything has kind of changed to remotely. Remote is good, but we cannot um, take away our traditional uh, jobs. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, you're going to have an overcrowdedness in our shelter system first because there's no employment and many families lost them. So they can't keep up with rent. Then you have the risk of families that are in their homes right now and that are, they may be in the verge of getting evicted because they have all this accumulated rent. Although right now we have uh, the the program that just, um, the initiative that is available for some families, I believe if they're making under $50,000 or $40,000 and they can prove that they lost income during the pandemic, they might be able to help them with the rent six months, 12 months. Yeah, yeah. Now, that also is going to make our shelter system overcrowded. Mm. But what is truly making our shelter system overcrowded is that we do not have options. We do not have another public housing available for us. It is only NYCHA. And NYCHA for decades, not because of COVID, for decades has neglected its residents. It is a bad landlord. And then it's too big of a landlord. It controls five boroughs. Mm. I personally think, and as a candidate, as a city council member, if this is what the voters of District 26 would like to see me in that seat, we have to break it down. 
NYCHA is too large and it needs to be held accountable for the continued negligence. Apartments infested with roaches, infested with rodents. We have families getting sick in these apartments. Their homes are not homes. They are hazardous homes. And that is unacceptable. And the public safety within our NYCHA developments, we must work with our community. Okay. And, and, and the responsibility is within the leaders of New York City and government. That's who's responsible for providing quality living for our NYCHA residents. And the time is overdue. So mm -hmm. I want to go to City Hall to be very vocal on that. My priorities in this campaign and upon becoming the city councilwoman in District 26, it will be the shelter system, our public housing, public safety, and education. Because without those, I can assure you that I wouldn't even be here having this interview with you and definitely not running for city council. Mm, okay, makes sense. Um, you know, let's stick with affordable housing for, for the moment. Um, a different type of affordable housing for that matter, not NYCHA, but this program, um, you know, where, you know, they set aside 25% of, you know, units for, you know, affordable housing under rezonings and, you know, it's at 130% area median income, that formula that I'm sure you're aware of and that, you know, was part of the FIPS housing project in Sunnyside. Um, you know, what do you think of that formula? What do you think of that whole process? I mean, especially as someone that knows probably more about NYCHA than anyone else in running on this campaign. Um, well well, I mean, I don't know that for sure, but you obviously know a lot about it. But uh, so what do you make of that, um, of, of the program, you know, that de Blasio has really pushed since he's been in office? Well, I will tell you, I'm a unique candidate in this race. I know it's crowded. We started with, I think, 23, then it went down to 21. Now we're 15 on the ballot. Hmm. I am the only Afro-Latina uh, running in this district. <clears throat> and I'm a unique candidate because I have lived these experiences that our residents are currently going through. Mm -hmm. When you talk to me about these, uh, the 50, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the area mean income yeah. uh, and all these calculations and uh, the, the luxury buildings, right? And mm -hmm. we're talking about NYCHA. I've been through it. While living in NYCHA, mm. I was on the verge of getting evicted because I had eight months fighting to get the repairs done in my apartment. Evicted from and where? Eight, I'm sorry? You, you almost got evicted from where? From uh, my NYCHA apartment, oh, my one-bedroom NYCHA you, apartment. Excuse my ignorance, but... So you, 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 get, you can get evicted from NYCHA, can you? I always just thought, well, you pay your 30%, but if you, if you, if you don't meet your 30%, you're going to be out, out on your backside like if you were the private developer. Is that the way it works? No, no, no. Okay. The 30% is only 30% of your income, whatever income. We have nurses. We have many uh, uh, graduates, you yeah. know, we, we have great people living in Nigeria oh, and they're paying their 30% exactly. yeah. of rent. Now, um, obviously, if you have some issues you're not paying, you could get evicted. If you just choose not to pay, it's like any other landlord, you must pay your rent. Mm. But in my case, it wasn't about a non-payment. It was about, I had eight months, like many families go through now and have gone through. Uh, there is no repairs. Uh, you know, oh, at times, Okay. You you call to get the repairs done and you're getting a ticket. That's the system in NYCHA. You get a ticket until mm. somebody goes to your house to do the repairs. But those tickets often are closed without doing the repairs. And that happens very often. Um, so in my case, I had eight months trying to get repairs from the chipping paint, from the mold, from the vermin, all of those complaints. And for example, I know what it is to cook and have a leak at the same time and mm. not know whatever, you know, water is coming down into my meals, what it was. So yeah. all of those complaints added up and I didn't receive any response. So I decided 
not that I decided, the advocate in me truly came out. And that's what's happening in our communities. I want to motivate and inspire our families that you must become your own advocate. And how do you do that? First, you inform yourself of who your city council members are, who your elected officials are. We must call 311. We must create kind of like you have to create your own caseload, right? Mm -hmm. Create a case for yourself. And that's what I did. I called New York One. We have to contact our local media when our landlord is not doing the necessary repairs. And that's what I had to do almost four years ago when I was living in NYCHA. So you withheld rent as sort of like protest to say, hey, guys, you're not getting, you're not doing the job. Yes, like I'm here. I'm withholding your rent and I'm here and I want to be heard and I want my repairs to be done. So that's exactly what I did. And unfortunately, because I did that, I received retaliation like many families do. And that's why I was in the verge of getting evicted. But it is important that we empower our community because I was an empowered resident. I knew the law and I knew my rights. So I went and I seeked for help. I seeked, uh, I, I received a support letter from our representative, Carolyn, Carolyn Maloney. Mm -hmm. I received a support letter from actually city council member, Jimmy Van Bramer, mm -hmm. uh, and from many other elected officials. And I send letters to uh, the, the, the higher ups in NYCHA. Yeah. And I had uh, New York One come in, but New York One didn't come in just to my apartment. I also organized other tenants that had a barrier when it came to their language. They spoke Spanish. So I got everybody together and we made the complaint and then the repairs came. But upon doing that, I received retaliation and that's how I was going to get in the verge of getting evicted. If it were not because of a legal aid that was the one who truly helped me and avoided for me to get evicted, I would have been evicted. And mm. it's so unfair. And this is what's happening every day. And I want to stop that when I go to city hall. If I become the city council member, I want to have in my office, if it's allowed, I would love to have a legal aid services for free for my constituents mm -hmm. because the abuse has to stop. Okay. And um, I, I share that story because I'll be able to answer um, your question about the luxury buildings that way. Upon going through that process while living in NYCHA, I found myself obviously wanting to move forward and to have a better quality life and be able to live in a different building and in a place and where my son can grow up, um, you know, without so much uh gang activity and many things that happen within NYCHA that must also stop because it's not just the repairs but there's also an environment of unsafety mm -hmm. and where our families feel unsafe our children feel unsafe so I didn't want to raise my son like that and I didn't have options I'm a single mother at the time not much options. I can't transfer to no, another apartment because you can't transfer unless your life is is on, you know, if, if you're, I, I don't know how to say it, sorry. But um, if you, if you're not going through something and where you, they have to transfer you, then you're, you don't, you're not eligible for it. Right. But I started to apply for these luxury apartments that you're talking about through HPD. And I applied to over 40 of them. Mm -hmm. And nothing never happened. But after 10 months, I did receive an email and it said, you know, Ms. Gomez, you have been selected, your application um, in order to move forward, bring all these documents. And that happened to me in the moment that I was being um, in the verge of being evicted and dealing with the legal process. So I was dealing with both processes, trying to get the new apartment and at the same time, not trying to get evicted and trying to get my repairs. Um, but to make a long story short, I was successful at getting uh, the apartment, the brand new apartment, the ones that we talk about being lotteries and luxury buildings. And um, that wasn't easy. That process was not easy. It is not meant for the average person. Mm. I was rejected three times because of this AMI system that they use and this specific calculator that is never in favor of the applicants. Mm. So um, I am very much aware of this system and it is one that also upon getting to city hall, we must work to change because How the- how would you change it? How would you change it? 
Number one, um, I have understood that it's a 20% to 80%. Um, and in my case, that's how it was. I was one of the 20%. Um, so we must increase that to 50%. It should be 50-50. I am all for developers coming in and uplifting our communities. But we need to make sure that the negotiations are fair for our community, especially on the residential side of things. We look for at least 50% of the residential units to be designed for 50% or lower of a AMI families. Uh, I truly believe that this will ensure families already living in the area and that they won't get pushed out due to a significant increase in rent. So we want parks, green spaces, and local union labor involved in the project, right? When you are coming to develop here. And on the commercial side of things, uh, I would like to see a portion of the square feet to be allocated to local community run endeavors, for example. And people who live around the area should be first in line when it comes to employment. So this cannot be a project that thinks about only attracting people from outside neighborhoods, and that's what happens sometimes. But let's go back to this AMI. The AMI that is being used is not locally. It includes Westchester and not mm. um, Naswa, I think. Uh, so we need to change that. And I think that the AMI should be reflective of our neighborhoods and our zip codes here, wherever the developer is going to develop this new luxury building. Mm -hmm. um, but I will tell you that my quality life and of my child has changed ever since I, I live in a new building. And that is the same quality, dignifying life that many residents here in District 26 and citywide need. Mm. And that's what I'm going to fight for in City Hall. And the only way to fight for that is to be able to sit at the decision-making table and to do the proper negotiations and where we present to the new developers what we want and need as a community. And if they're not willing to meet halfway, which is that 50, 50 percent, then they are not welcome in our neighborhood. So you've got Especially a balance. So you've got a balance to deal with, though, right? I mean, yes. you've got, if you've got one guy that's paying five thousand dollars a month for his rent, and he's living next to a guy that's paying five hundred a month for his rent you're going to sort of get a bit of bitterness going on. So you've got to get the balance right. How would you try and ensure that, you know, uh, you can get a good balance whereby, you know, everyone gets a fair shake, so to speak? Just like you said, mm. we need a fair shot. Mm. So, you know, you have the money to come and invest in New York City. Right. But if you're coming to invest, as is happening, Mm. And you are investing in a new development, beautiful luxury, and you're building it right in front of a NYCHA development that you can see with your own eyes that is falling apart. It is in deplorable conditions and that that side of the street is filled with garbage and there's crime. We must come to an agreement. You yeah. cannot be there, across yeah. the street. Yeah. You understand? Because... Yeah. These people have been here for 30, 40 years. Mm. So you cannot do that. You have to bring them in and give them options. And I truly think as a city council candidate and upon becoming the city councilwoman, that any resident that is living in New York City housing and that has for years been going through neglect when it comes to other uh, repairs in their homes, those residents should have priority when it comes to any new development coming into our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and another thing to end there with, with yeah. this, oh, yeah, and yeah. it's just citywide. Hmm. And, and that's what my campaign runs on. Okay. I would love to see an equitable district because we talk about New York City being equitable, the need of it being equitable, but we cannot have a New York City that is equitable if our districts are not. So the type of mindset that I bring to City Hall is that it is time to work from the bottom up. The top down does not work anymore. So in District 26, upon me becoming the city councilwoman, 
for this district. I will represent it with dignity, with a lot of humility, but beyond all, with a lot of professionalism. And in order to do that, we must look at the district, look at the funding that I will get to um, be allocated in the district, and let's lift and restore our neighborhoods that have been neglected. For example, the Blissville community. Mm -hmm. You can look at it as the start or the end of the district. But in that community, there are lacking schools, there are lacking parks, there are lacking recreation um, um, centers, and they have over a thousand families there, majority immigrants. And I understand why they're not getting any funding, because the funding goes where the votes are. And that has to end. Mm -hmm. I think that if we concentrate ourselves in creating an equitable district, and we do that citywide, then we will see that equitable city that we're all aiming to get. Okay. Glennis, we've been through we've talked about a lot of things here. And, <laughs> and it's been going on a while, but you've given me a real education actually on on shelters and NYCHA. So I appreciate that. Um, well, now that you said that, um, and if you allow me, uh, it, it's this is why I'm running for city council mm. because there's a perspective on many systems that has to be broken. There's a perspective that the people that are living in the shelter system are, I would say the, the in, uh, many of the people that you see homeless in the streets. Yeah. Um, and those people that are homeless in the streets um, have other challenges. And those challenges could be mental health and where those, um, res those, those people should not go into the shelter system. They should go into a rehabilitation center. And then the people that we do have in the shelter system are looked at as if they're just living off the system. You have real working families right. in need of permanent dignified homes. But because there is no affordable housing, they, the, the, they are, the system pushes them to be there. And it's time to take them out. And we can do it in, in New York City. We can do it. That's why it's very important that people go out to vote on June 22nd and start to elect um, real people and people that have gone through real struggles and that can really bring not just the educational and the work experience, but the lived experiences are needed more than ever. Yeah, okay. Two quick, more que two quick questions. Um, one, community boards. Uh, who do you think should be on these community boards and, and how would you appoint mem community board members, just to, to make it quick? Well, for community boards, um, I know that in the past and currently, uh, many of the members are being appointed by their city council members. Hmm. Um, I think that it's time that we change that um, because I think that that's where the opportunity to, um, to have politics take part and special interest comes in. Mm -hmm. And I have attended many community board meetings wearing my DOE hat. And I've also attended community board meetings when I used to work in government and politics. And these meetings usually last for four hours and it is only maybe until the end that if you sign up, you can speak in the public session. Um, and most residents, that's when they speak up. Um, but also these meetings are done like after 6 p.m. Um, I know that things have changed now. A lot is being done remotely. So um, even when it wasn't remotely and now that it is remotely, the audience and the residents are not reflective of all the real struggling families in the district or citywide. Um, so... I think that we have to empower our communities. And how do we do that? I think that if we change the system from a city council member appointing a member to the community boards, I think they should do something similar to like when you're running for office, not a campaign because it takes money and you shouldn't be raising money if you're not even gonna pay, get paid for a position. Um, and it's a non-paid position, but maybe something similar to like petitioning in where you collect signatures. And if you are that community leader, you shouldn't have a problem getting signatures. Um, we should also uh, look at outlining um, their qualifications and of people that show investment in, in the community. 
Mm. Um, also, I think that in the community, we should have like a starting point. And we don't want special interest in a community board. And that's what's happening when we allow city council members to appoint them. I wouldn't want to be that city council member that has five board members in community, bo community board one or two that I know. Because mm. at the end of the day, as much as you want to say that there's not a conflict of interest, there is. There is. And, 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 and you will be potentially giving me preference on certain things. You may be giving me more information that you would give another elected official. So, and it's, I think it's time to diversify the board so that it could truly look more like the people who live in the communities and the board should be reflective of the struggles that the community faces. And we cannot, we cannot have council members involved in this process. So I think let's hand it over to the community and let the community elect its members. Okay. Because at the end of the day, community boards really do, I would say, the dirty work uh, for everybody else. Mm. Um, they're the point of contact and they do a lot. So let's give them the freedom and let's empower the community. Okay. Yeah. No. Okay. So last question, Glennis, is transportation. Um, what can be done to increase or improve the transportation network here in Western Queens? And I'll throw Western Queens in all together, including the 22nd Council District, which I guess you're kind of on the border of. So you've got a good sense of how it's all working in Western Queens. So, so, so what would you like to see in terms of well, improvement? Uh, when it comes to the transportation, uh, we have a lot to improve on. Mm. Uh, we need to do more uh, for our public transportation system. Our trains are extremely slow. Mm -hmm. um, at times, I know there's a lot of issues with the seven train, uh, extremely dirty and dangerous. Mm -hmm. Like I said, public safety uh, is non-negotiable and we need more police presence in our uh, subways. And unfortunately, uh, we need more police pres presence uh, during the daylight. <laughs> it's, it's sad to say that in the 21st century in New York City. Um, and especially in our subways where I would say all New York City to some extent is dependent. I'm dependent of the uh, transportation, uh, the public transportation here in New York City. And sometimes it's also not accessible. And this is not just, when I talk about accessibility, it's not just for people with disability, for example that may have a wheelchair or um, are disabled. But I say this also for our parents. There are single mothers and even, you know, fathers and families with their strollers. And it's really hard to <laughs> go down the stairs, you know, with a stroller, a backpack that you must carry um, so yeah. that you have all the things that you need for your children and carry those heavy, heavy strollers and not have any accessibility. So that's the type of work that is needed in our public transportation. Our buses here specifically in Queens is such a big borough. Um, our buses are slow and they're not timely. I've waited for the bus 20, 30 minutes and there are buses, I think is the 104. <laughs> the 104, um, it runs like an every 20 minutes, but then the 20 minutes get there and the bus is not there. So now you have to wait another 20 minutes <laughs> hoping that uh, the bus gets there. Um, and then we also have bikes and pedestrians often don't have enough space uh, to coexist. Mm. I am for creating, um, you know, bike lanes and we must protect our bike riders. Uh, but we have to create these bike lanes in in a space where it's, it's enough to coexist. Mm. So dropping the fear, oh, now that the last thing, dropping the fear <laughs> of public, trans uh, public transportation is something I will definitely continue to advocate for because we need to create a system that is accessible and easy Wait, to navigate. What do you mean by dropping the fear? You mean? Isn't, <laughs> let's bring that fear down. It's just like the rent is too high. Mm. Well, <laughs> we need both it's a basic need we need to travel we need to eat and we need to have a place to call home 
Let's bring those I mean, fears down. I mean, contrarians would say, how are you going to pay for the system? But um, Well, mm. well, let's, let's be honest. Mm. Um, they have, in the past decade, it's only been an increase. Yeah, it's that's right. It's always been an increase. Mm. So if you are increasing the fare, and so today we have dirty subways, we don't have reliable buses, and we are unsafe, then we have to start to see how we're using this funding. Mind you, if you starve it of more funding, wouldn't it get worse? If you what? Starve it of more funding, would it get worse? It's it's not a matter of starving. It's a matter of really investigating what is being done with the funding hmm. and really reallocating within the system the same way for the NYPD. Okay, yeah. Now, Glennis... Uh, I've asked you a lot of questions. Is there anything you want to say yourself? I mean, we've covered a lot. Any, <laughs> any, any closing thoughts? Well, um, thank you again for this opportunity, Queen's Post. I think sometimes we leave the best for last. And I think that this is the best time to have an interview with you when there's only almost 20 days to election yeah. day. Um, so I definitely want to thank every single viewer that's going to see this. And um, all that I plan to do as your city councilwoman is to truly represent this district with a lot of humility, with a lot of dignity, and with a lot of professionalism. Um, I want to truly make real change in City Hall. So with my educational background, the work experience, but most important with these lived experiences, I'm going to be very vocal for our community. And we are in 2021 where change is in, it's inevitable. It's, it's, you can not avoid it. And change is here. And I want to be part of that change. And I want to bring change into our district. As I said before, and I hope that everybody quotes me on this, I am only here to bring back that dignity, that unity and trust that our communities are in dire need of. And if we all want an equitable city, we must govern and lead from the bottom up and we must make our districts equitable. And that's what I plan to do for District 26. All right. Well, thank you very much, Glenn. So please vote for me, June 22nd. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget to vote and please rank me number one. <laughs>